How is everybody? Good. All right, so I'm Michael Lomax, and I'm going to moderate this panel, this extraordinary panel, this incredible group of activists and educators who are with us today. So I think we're, this is a big, this is a big room. And I wish they could turn on the light so we could see you. And maybe they will, but there's always a technical challenge, so they're, they're working on it. But I want you to know we on the panel want to see you. So hopefully that may happen during the course of uh, the hour that we have together. You know, in his first account of his life, in the 1850s, Frederick Douglass declared that education is the pathway from slavery to freedom. So from its earliest days, the black freedom struggle, struggle connected education access directly to human and civil rights. And the journey for full citizenship has been a journey for equal educational opportunity and attainment. Today at this panel, we have an extraordinary opportunity to be part of an intergenerational conversation among activists whose work and lives intertwine the issues of social justice and education opportunity for black Americans. They're all teachers. Teachers who who do, who make, who change. Um, the experiences of our panelists span six decades, from public school desegregation that resulted from the Brown versus Board of Education ruling through the 1963 March on Washington, and the student movement in Mississippi and Alabama and throughout the South, to the Black Power Movement, to the contemporary Black Lives Matter movement that has emerged and grown from brutal police violence in Ferguson and New York, in South Carolina and Chicago and across the nation. Our panelists are women and men who at some moment in their individual lives stepped from the sidelines as observers to center stage as activists. Why? What did they learn? What can we learn from them and appropriate to this 25th anniversary reunion convening, they all have been teachers. And we want to connect this conversation directly to why many of us are here, all of us are here, who are here as teachers, as students, as activists. In some ways, this, this is a mirror kind of conversation. Two generations looking at their younger and more mature selves, uh, but also gaining new insights into who they are today. Let me introduce very briefly, and no introduction can do justice to these extraordinary individuals. Uh, to my far right, Dr. Terrence Roberts. We first encountered Dr. Roberts nearly 60 years ago in Little Rock, Arkansas, as he, a high school student, 
made the courageous choice to become what we now refer to as one of the Little Rock Nine. To Dr. Roberts' left is Joyce Ladner, Dr. Joyce Ladner, sociologist, leading educator, professor at Howard University and interim president at Howard University, but who began her public life as a high school student in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, boldly establishing an NAACP chapter in her own community and later joining in the civil rights movement in Jackson. I think it caused her to get expelled from one institution. <laughs> 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 but the good news is that she was embraced by a United Negro College Fund, historically black college, hey. Tougaloo College. <laughs> to Joyce's left, someone who I don't think needs much of an introduction to this crowd, DeRay McKesson. At DeRay, <laughs> uh, you know, and we, lest we forget, he was at one point senior director of human capital with the Minneapolis Public Schools and is a Teach for America alum having taught sixth grade math in New York City, but today, activist candidate for mayor of Baltimore. <laughs> and to my extreme right, but your extreme left, uh, is Brittany Packnett. <laughs> Education executive and activist for racial and social equity, an alum of Washington University in St. Louis. and American University. Brittany has been an elementary school teacher, legislative staffer, education policy advocate, and currently serves as executive director of TFA St. Louis. <laughs> Much more to say, but I'm going to stop right there and begin this conversation. Now, the intent here, you all, is that I'm going to ask them questions. They're going to give you know, good answers. And th hopefully, we get a conversation going among them, and I can step out of the way. And then when we still have about 20 or so minutes to go, hopefully, the lights can go up, and people who in the audience who have questions can uh, step up and ask them. But I want to begin at, a, at the intimate, personal level and ask each of you, and, and I'll just you know, I just work our way down. It doesn't have to be in chronological order. But what was the moment in your own individual lives when you made the decision to be an activist? DeRay? So I went to St. Louis um, on August 16th, 2014. Uh, it was 1 o'clock in the morning. I sit on the couch and I can, can, is he? Gora. Hello. There we go. <laughs> I had an Adele moment right there. It was great. I was like, oh. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, August 16th, I was on the couch, one o'clock in the morning, and I saw people tweeting about Ferguson. I was like, I want to do something. Got in the car, 
went down to St. Louis. At the beginning, I was a witness. I didn't go to protest. I wasn't an activist uh, around those issues. I was a witness. I wanted to go see. I met Brittany. Brittany was one of the uh, first people that I met when I arrived in St. Louis. And I'll never forget the second day I was there, I got tear gassed. And I, uh, that day is something that is vivid to me. It was in that moment that I became a protester. And the moment was this, this thing about like, this is not the America I know. That, that when I thought about the police for so long, it was this idea of like officer safety. And I had been pulled over before and an officer drew his gun at the window, but I was like, that never happens. This was like an off thing. And now I know that that is not true, but it was in that moment that I was like, you know what, this is not the America I know and I'm willing uh, to fight for a different one that I can not only see in America that is not this, but I will put everything I have on the line to fight for it. And that I'm one of many people who are willing to do that. Joyce? I had a different path. When I was a little girl in the late 40s, my great uncle, who had fought in World War I in France, used to sit on the back porch and listen to Brooklyn Dodgers. Jackie Ro and whenever Jackie Robinson, the first black to go into the major league, came to bat, he would jump up and down and shout, and we kids did too. And then he turned to my sister and me, Dory and me, and say, now you have to be the Jackie Robinson of your day. So <clears throat> from that point to um, a family friend giving us in this closed society where there was no communication from the outside world pretty much, Mississippi, um, he started bringing us Ebony Magazine, Pittsburgh Courier newspaper, Chicago Defender newspaper, and believe it or not, one of our neighbor's um, brother worked on the Illinois Central Railway on the, uh, the city of New Orleans train from Chicago to, to New Orleans. And he used to throw the Chicago Defender off the train to us, and we kids would run out and get it and sit there and read about what was going on with what we called Negro people in other places. <clears throat> Fast forward to the murder of Emmett Till. That was the profound change in my life. I was almost 12 years old. He was a 14-year-old boy. We were going through the same psychosocial developmental periods in our lives where young people, kids at that age are trying to become empowered as they go into more independence. And he, we'd never heard of a child being lynched. Men, yes, but not children. And so, I vowed that one day I was going to exonerate, I mean, not exonerate, but to fight against those people who murdered him. We're gonna get even. And I interviewed many, many people in SNCC. I became a field secretary for SNCC while I was in college. And many, many of my friends in SNCC saw that same photograph that I saw on the cover of Jet Magazine of Emmett Till lying in his casket where his mother refused to ha allow the people, the embalm to em embalmers to reconstruct his face after he'd been pulled from the Tallahatchie River. Mrs. Till said, I want the world to see what they did to my baby. And so that picture became the <clears throat> rallying cry for us. I have dubbed our generation, my generation, the Emmett Till generation. And that's my story. Mm. Robert? It's an amazing story. I had an epiphany at age 13, living in Little Rock under the suppressive segregation by law and custom. I had to learn the rules of segregation in order to survive. I never quite understood why I had to, but I did understand the life-threatening issues that would result if I didn't. I walked into the Crystal Burger, local hamburger joint, white-owned. I'd been there many times, so I knew the drill. I knew that as black people, you could go in there and buy food, but you could not eat in there. You couldn't sit down. But you had to wait standing up and then take your food out. On this particular summer day, I walked in and did my usual order. It was back in the day when I really ate that kind of food. <laughs> I, I've, I've since uh, learned otherwise, but I, I made the order. But the restaurant was sparsely populated, very few patrons. 
all these empty seats. Without thinking about it, I sat down at this stool around the, at the counter. But when I did that, everything in the Crystal Burger came to an immediate halt. The very few people who were there turned their attention toward me. Interestingly enough, not a word was spoken, but the unspoken message was so palpable you could almost feel it. I got it. I received the message. But then I felt something snap inside of me, and I jumped off that stool, canceled the order, ran out, and there I was on the sidewalk outside the Crystal Burger, crying my eyes out, feeling this melange of emotions that ran the gamut from fear to anger and all other kinds of things. And I knew at that point that I could no longer participate in a system that saw me as less than human. And it was at that point that I became a candidate for everything else that transpired. Brittany? I think, can you hear me? No. No? Keep speaking, they'll turn it on. Hello, hello. It's me. <laughs> yes. um, hey everyone you know I think like a lot of I think like everyone up here there are probably lots of moments um, I, I was in some ways raised to be about this work I was at protests with my father before I could walk um, but I'll never forget being in secondary school and being a part of about a, a dozen group of students who decided to start um, our diversity organization at a predominantly white, very affluent private school. Uh, and we would make speeches and morning assembly and we would have meetings and awareness campaigns and got the school to host uh, an all school symposium on racial injustice. And after that symposium, there was a young man, a white man, a year older than me, who um, was very wealthy. His father was on the board of trustees was in a very wealthy part of St. Louis. He was so rich, he lived across the street from the school, uh, whereas I live 45 minutes away in North St. Louis County near Ferguson. And uh, the fact that this club existed at all really bothered him. Apparently, for some reason, I was um, picked to be the focus of his ire. And so he used to see me in the hallways in between classes and come up after me and harass me and say, am I oppressing you today? Is my presence oppressive to you? Why are you creating trouble? Why are you mixing things up? You know, my mom always taught me, if somebody's talking mess, just ignore them and go about your business. And so that's what I did for most of the time. And one day I finally just snapped and I turned around and I was like, yo, you really can't do this to people. His decision in that moment was to spit at me. Yeah. Now, it's a good thing the spit didn't land because I probably would have gotten kicked out of school, but the next, I, I remember deciding two things. One, that the fear in me told me that I, I couldn't really tell anybody. Um, unfortunately, that was proven to be true because I told two people uh, and um, one of those people had the power to discipline him and nothing ever happened. Um, but the second thing I decided was that if telling the truth about our lived experience as people of color, was that bothersome to you that you had to spit at me? Then we must be on to something right. Mm. And so, I didn't tell that story for years. Uh, September 2014, after I had decided to step out into the streets of Ferguson um, on August the 10th, um, after I had gotten tear gassed, after I had met DeRay, um, after I had this really awful feeling in the pit of my stomach from realizing that every single adult in St. Louis, myself included, was complicit in Michael Brown's death, I was asked to go back to my high school and to address our students in morning assembly. And it was the first time, um, it was the first time ever that I told that story publicly in the very same place that it happened because I was reminded in that moment that the true power of protest is the power of disruption and discomfort to shake us up out of our dry places and remind us that we have work to do. And so that full circle moment is, is one of those moments for me. So I, I want to stick with that for a minute with all of you. Um, because you put yourselves in extraordinary danger 
each of you differently because of your decision to be activists. And um, you not only became, you know, not only put yourselves at risk, but you became in some ways dangerous to your communities or perceived sometimes as dangerous to your community. So I want to just stick with for a few minutes the contradictions, the ambiguities, the the, 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 the lights are coming on. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, it, it seems like a heroic, you know, clear cut decision in retrospect. And the farther back we go, the more heroic and more dangerous it seems. But in fact, there was a, Joyce, uh, it was not easy to make those kinds of choices in Hattiesburg, Mississippi in the early 1960s. It wasn't, but <clears throat> I attribute it to the strength of my mother. My mother was a very strong, tough woman. And she always taught us that your beliefs aren't worth very much if you don't stand up for them. Hmm. From the time I was a little girl, she said it, and I was trying to figure out what does she mean, what does she mean? Mm -hmm. And she, she had 10 sisters and brothers. And they were all very independent types of folk. Not a single one of them ever worked for a white person. They refused. They had the, so they had their own little gigs, little jobs. Uh, and they had been brought up over five generations. And it was a mantra that went from one generation to the other, that you're as good as anyone. And so I grew up you know, trying to embrace this and never doubting for a moment that I was inferior to any white person, ever. Um, I think my mother would have killed me had I expressed that kind of view. But my mother was not in the civil rights movement. So when I got active in the movement, mother would say, oh my God, you might get hurt. Said, but mother, I learned courage from you. And what I also learned was courage was not the absence of fear but the ability to prevail in spite of it. That's right. I cannot remember not being afraid. Amen. Always afraid. But you pick up and you keep going. I remember one time, I was uh, spring break in 1963, I believe. I'd gone to Greenwood, Mississippi. And we and SNCC had a real, uh, we brought all our workers in to Greenwood to, because we were getting people uh, they were marching to the courthouse to register to vote. And I always did the office work because I was good at that. Um, and so I was, all the people, just collating the names of all the, and addresses of all the people who had gone to the, down to the courthouse to attempt to register to vote. Uh, but anyway, fast forward, I went home that night, stayed with some local family. Next morning I came back to the office it had been bombed. So I started scurrying around, getting all this information before the police got there. So if the police got in there, all the, our files, they would have known who we were talking to, who in the community were providing us support. And those people's homes could have been burned, they could have been shot, certainly fired from their jobs and so on. There were times when we outran the police, we outran the Klan. People in SNCC had particular skills. I said mine were in the office. Um, but guys like Stokely, Stokely Carmichael, was a great driver. <laughs> Ivanhoe Donaldson was a fantastic driver. They could get you in and out of places <laughs> with the me least har harm. Um, we didn't want people who were not afraid or didn't have a healthy respect for the danger involved because they could get you hurt. Mm -hmm. If someone came in and said, I must shoot these crackers, I'll kill them if they bother me, or I'll hit them while I'm on the protest land, you pull them away from the land. I remember in that same Greenwood um, campaign that we had going, a group of people had gone down, were, were, were marching to the courthouse, and then all of a sudden I saw this young woman running toward me, where's the payphone, where's the payphone? Back then we, there were no cell phones. So I found a, I told her, I said, right over here. She said, I got to call the Justice Department. And I'm standing there. How does a black woman know 
Anybody in the Justice Department to call? <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was uh, Marion Wright Edelman. <laughs> Marion had come down f uh, for spring break mm -hmm. uh, from Yale Law School to work with us. And she told me years later, when I told, reminded her of that story, she said, you know what happened when I got um, John Dora on the, on the telephone? He was head of civil rights, you know. He, she, so he said, now calm down and tell me what's happening. And she, you know, here she is running from the dogs. You know, the worst thing, the one thing that could inspire fear in me were the dogs being, and I was chased by police dogs, because, and it brought, and I'm closing now, but it brought to, my, to the fore in me my most primal fears, and I always likened it to slaves run away, running away from mm. the dogs. But that happened, you know, when I got expelled from, from, for organizing demonstration in 1961 at Jackson State College, the police brought the police dogs on the campus. Um, then it fired tear gas as we were marching downtown. And I thought they were shooting at us because tear gas goes out, pop, pop, pop. It sounded like a gun. And here we were just running, scattering everywhere. I ran into a black woman's home, a little shotgun house reached my hand through the screen, unlatched the door, because she didn't get to the door fast enough. We ran in the house, and she said, what's going on? We told her very briefly, the police are chasing us, and then she said, come on in, they're not gonna bother me, and she was listening to uh, a radio program, and she was ironing, and as she ironed, she said, it's a crying shame that these people are treating these children like dogs, like common dogs and they're not better not to come into my house. She wasn't talking to us, she was ironing and speaking. Those were the people who supported us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Robert, the spit did land. Did the spit land on you? I mean, I, I remember those images of, uh, and, and very often the ones that are the most vivid for me, when you were brought to, you and the other eight went to Central High. Well, it's was, true. Was the, was the women <clears throat> screaming and yelling, and I think yeah. spitting, too. They were. Yeah. They were. They, they did. They, you know, I often characterize it as anything that you can think of that one human being might possibly do to another, they did to us. And one of the more poignant moments happened years later. My youngest daughter and I were down at Little Rock in the now museum done by the Park Service. And I noticed she was sitting at this console with the headphones on and crying. And I couldn't figure it out, so I went over and put on the extra set of headphones and, and started listening and watching what she was seeing. And it was a talking head. It was an, a white student, now an adult, who had been at Central with me, recounting an episode that had happened to me, which really got her attention and roiled her emotions so much so that in the end we were both crying copious tears because that was the thing that had happened. It was true, but I'd never shared it with her. So she didn't have any preparation for dealing with it. So, yeah, it was, it was that kind of crazy stuff. You know, both of you have spoken about, well, Joyce, you spoke about the image of Emmett Till, uh, that powerful, powerful image of him that was on the cover of Jet magazine. Do you remember? I'm, yes, and well, I mean, you know, you, so growing up in Los Angeles, and then I'm a little younger, but not much, and so uh, the images of a black boy not very different in age from me, uh, that was a terrifying image, and didn't know what to do with it. Right. Yeah. But, you know, so I want to, DeRay and Brittany, uh, if we could, I mean, one of the things that is so powerful about the work that you've been involved in is that you have been the creators of the images, or the, I won't say creators, but yeah, well, I guess you have. I mean, you've produced, you've taken photographs, you've, you've sent them out, you've interpreted them, uh, you've used the media as opposed to been, being just the object of the media. And the media was so powerful, the images that were broadcast across the country. I told Robert, I saw, I mean, we had a TV in 1957, so you could see it. Um, but now everybody has. Smartphone. And 
DeRay and Brittany, you all have manipulated that. How, how has that been a part of the work? DeRay should answer this first. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> go on. Well, get started, DeRay. I mean, you know, yeah, go you on. Know, I think, um, you know, I had 800 followers last August, or August 2014. I have about 300,000 today. Uh, I get about 100 million impressions every 28 days, and that is very different. You know, my What's an impression? Uh, like an interaction with a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Intergenerational dialogue. Yeah, we had yeah. memory graph machines. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my critics would be like, DeRay, the media made you something. What I tell them is it was the, it was the absence of the media that made me anything. All right. mm -hmm. That we were the people who became the storytellers and the, and the chroniclers of what was happening. And I think about so much of our work was literally just telling the truth. I often talk about this idea of uh, being able to tell the truth in public as the power of protest. That that is what we did every day. We just told the truth in public um, and we made that commitment. I think about it too as like baby steps is that we made a commitment in those early days to fight today and return tomorrow. Mm. And we made that over and over and over and we were afraid to, uh, but it was something about like we believed in it so much and it was like just put one foot in front of the other. Don't try and run the whole race today, but one foot right. in front of the other and that got us there. It is, you know, people joke about the vest, but it, um, it just makes me feel safe. It's like a completely irrational thing. I think about being in Baltimore where I was doing a Q&A with the director of the Panthers documentary and somebody tweeted in that they were going to shoot me. So the, you know, the organizers got all nervous and I'm like, it'll be fine. What happens, happens. You know, I'm good. And I go there, we're watching the movie. <laughs> the lights come on. They shut down the theater. The employees are afraid. So the whole theater closed. I mean, it's like a huge deal all of a sudden. Um, and it really is this vest. I just like feel covered and safe, like irrational, but real. Um, <laughs> And I think so, so much of that is it's real, though. I like I didn't know what being covered meant before, like in a religious sense. And that's why you're wearing this I, all, every day, all day. It just I feel safe, you know. It just <laughs> they were like, day, "Are you nervous?" Day. I'm like, "I'm good." Like, <laughs> and we went back in and watched the movie alone because the entire movie theater shut down, so we saw the end of it. But but those things are really important. I think that the threat of protest for us has been that we're going to continue telling the truth in public. Yep. That there's something about like what does it mean? to force people to confront these things that they don't want to confront. And the other thing is like, I, I think that what we've been able to do with social media is invite people into the conversation differently. Like in groups of teachers, I talk about intergenerational trauma by saying, this idea of like a generation reader, I'm a third generation reader. My great grandmother could sign her name and she was very proud of it. But I'm the third generation of people in my family who can read and comprehend text. So we pose that question to people like, what generation reader are you? <laughs> is like a different way to tell the story about trauma. Mm -hmm. When we ask people too, like what does it mean to win? I think so, so, so often people in organizing spaces, uh, there can be an addiction to fighting as opposed to uh, impulse to win. Mm -hmm. And like pushing people to think about like, uh, what kind of world do you wanna live in, right? Hope is a belief that our tomorrows can be better than our today's. Um, and how do we like get that message out to people in ways that we otherwise could not, I think is powerful. Can I ask him a question? Yeah. yeah. By the way, I'm on your, your list. Like, DeRay and Nessa? Uh, oh, Netta, yeah, Netta, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, who is Netta? <laughs> she's here. She should she, be here. She, she's no, she's I, at the conference. I signed up when you were in, in Ferguson. I nice. signed up to get on your list. But anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> I did, so I read it. And I read, I, I, I take great pride in knowing what the current generation is doing, how you think, why you think this way, and you know, my generation gives you tremendous support. We're very much right there with you. But what I was going to ask, say is that I, I saw a kind of, you guys weren't afraid of the police. I mean, you were like giving it to them, just <laughs> going right back at them. We didn't do that because the cops would literally have killed us. Yes. I mean, they, they wanted to kill you. But I was so proud to say, for a while, I was looking at it, and then finally it occurred to me, because they're not afraid of the cops. And you are our children, our grandchildren, you know? Mm. And I would like to think that what we did, had, in some measure, gave you that kind of confidence to keep, yeah. keep going. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we were... Yeah. You know, I think... Um, we were really... 
We were really aware that we didn't invent resistance and we didn't discover injustice last August, right? right. Like we, you know, we get it, and that was a real thing. And you know, people, it's funny because people look back at us marching and they think that we did it like in solidarity with the '60s. It was illegal to stand still in St. Louis. It wasn't like a fun thing to march. It was we would get arrested on on the spot if we were. It was called the five second rule. So if you stood still for longer than five seconds, um, which was a wild thing. But we, you know, I think that there was more fear in the beginning. Right. Um, and then there was a moment where it was like, we are right. You know, we're on the right side of justice and we'll just be right there. So, yeah, yeah we're, you know, the police were like, we're going to be here, you know. So, and there was something like that. And we saw that. What I think I didn't anticipate was that that was spread across the country. I think about going to all these other cities. And I'm there and I see people stand up. I'm like, oh, look at that. So that has been really powerful to see it spread. Mm-hmm. I think about Baltimore where, uh, you know, the... the the confrontation between the police and those students that day was, I was there and I was like, these students were the most organized, they were some of the most organized protests I've seen in the country, and it just emerged. It was like right. really powerful to see. So, yeah, and, and honestly, Dr. Lander, the point that you made was the initial thing that I thought, right? So, the, the mere optics of the trauma that you all endured at the hands of the police Um, made it such that Ferguson Police Department, St. Louis County Police Department were going to do a whole lot of things to us. But there was some piece of us that was like, I think somebody here knows not to do what they did to y'all, right? And so there, we are absolutely like standing on your shoulders, right? There's no doubt about that in any of our minds. Um, And, 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 and this point that DeRay made about students is critically important because you know, I've told this story before. The first time I got tear gassed, I was standing next to a middle school student. I was um, trying to take video of him. We were trying to get this don't shoot hashtag out and we were taking videos of young people saying, you know, I want to graduate, don't shoot. And so I'm about to take the video and the announcement comes out um, from the armored vehicle. This is no longer a peaceful assembly. You're ordered to disperse immediately. Everybody looked around, everybody was completely peaceful. And if they wanted us to disperse immediately, you would think they give a, would give us time to disperse. They didn't want us to disperse, they wanted to gas us, so two seconds later they did. And we run, and I, I can't find this kid when it's over. Um, when I finally find him, he's cleaning his eyes out, um, and he picks up his little cardboard sign and walks right back out into the middle of the street. I mean, you want to talk about bravery? You want to talk about fearlessness? Like, I was like, if you can stand out there, the least I can do is stand with you, right? And so there, there was, I think, a level of fairness, fearlessness and still is from our children in particular. If we want to credit anyone uh, in your generation or ours for why this spread across the country, why this has made the kind of change that it has both then and now, um, and why we're still talking about this, it's because our young people decided that enough was enough and we followed suit. And it, you know, danger is relative because I've told that story before and I got a call on Black Friday of 2014, a very random call that said, you need to fly out to the White House. So, I found myself on that next Monday in the Oval Office sitting next to the president with about seven other activists in the room. And before I got there, somebody told me not to tell that story, Mm -hmm. right? Because it was dangerous. Dangerous for what? Yeah. Right? Like dangerous to my career? Dangerous to my, like we had already stood up to the police. What was telling the president this story going to do? Just lost you. Hello? Nope. (laughs) <laughs> yes, DJ Collins. Hello. No, yeah. major key. It's a major key. Right. <laughs> real. Um, uh, right. So, so what I was saying was, if we had already been gassed, if we had already stood up to the police, if I've already been spit at, what is telling the president a story really going to do to me? Um, and, and I, so you know, danger. I, I, danger really is relative, but often we decide that telling the truth is too dangerous. I would urge us to recognize that most often our silence is more costly. You know, uh, in, 1960, in 1963, when, when um, Dr. King was leading the Birmingham crusade, uh, school children uh, left by the school, got, went out of the schools by the hundreds to protest even elementary school kids. In fact, Freeman Habrowski, who was president of University of Maryland, Baltimore County, was the youngest person arrested. They fire-hosed the kids. 
And Dr. King was attacked for using the children. And what he essentially said is that he didn't use the children. The children made that decision on their own. Mm -hmm. Some of the kids left in classrooms uh, where the teacher said, maybe you shouldn't go, while other teachers said, it's up to you. They jumped out the windows and, of the schools and, and went anyway. Children have a tremendous sense of what is right and wrong, and they exercise it. Yeah. You know, um, I'm torn between talking a little bit more about the trauma. Could you talk more about it? Because a group of us in SNCC want to have been advocating for, and especially the, the um, we in SNCC are still very, very close. Mm -hmm. um, the group in the Bay Area, friends, I mean, um, SNCC, SNCC uh, uh, workers have been advocating for years for social security benefits for civil rights workers who were victims of trauma. We have among us some people who would be labeled the walking wounded, where the civil rights movement just destroyed their ability to function. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, mm. I think of people who are no longer with us, mm -hmm. who were active in, the, in SNCC, and um, now you look back and you say that was post-traumatic stress. Sure. Mm. Uh, so I, I do want to just, because you are a, a psychologist. Uh, um, sociologist. So you are a sociologist. Yeah. Oh, you're a sociologist. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we got you covered. But I, I, I wonder, you know, because there is, well, there is the trauma of, of the oppressed and there's the trauma of the protest. So I mean, just, just a word on that and then we're going to move on to another. Oh, topic. okay, yeah, that, that's a very important point. There are a number of people in this country who fear terrorism, but what they don't realize is the country has been the hotbed of terror for black people for centuries. Right. And when you, when you think about the, the, the psychological impact, I'll give you just a, a personal story about my own mom's trauma. During the time I was a student at Central, she didn't tell me about this until 20 years later, but during the time I was there, someone called her up one day, very authoritative voice on the end of the phone, Mrs. Roberts, I regret to have to inform you, but your son Terrence has been terribly beaten. I don't know if he will live for another half hour. Gave her all the bloody, gory details, and she went over the psychological edge right there, pulled herself together enough to get up to the school. The principal helped calm her down and escorted her to the classroom. She peeped in there and saw that I was okay. I didn't know she was out there. She went home. 20 years later, I find out. But she suffered that psychological trauma. I don't know how she dealt with it, actually, or my dad, for that matter. When you multiply that by countless other people that I don't even know about, but I do know it did happen, you have not only walking wounded, but you have people who will never be able to function right. as a consequence of doing what? Just seeking a place at the table? Yeah. Seeking their rights. You know? But there will also be the walking wounded of those who, who were subjected to that and didn't stand up and fight back. I mean, the, right. the, 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 the trauma of the oppressed. I, I wanna just go back to, to something that is so different about the movement, the Black Lives Matter movement. And that is that you do own the medium. I mean, th that story, DeRay, would not have been told across the country if, if social media hadn't forced it to be told because there were people all across the country learning about those events, not through the curated networks and uh, newspapers, but through your curation or Brittany yours, so uh, what, what kind of, how does that empower differently? You know, I really think that being the owners of the space and the owners of our own narrative have allowed us to bring nuance and complication to blackness such that we can be black in our full humanity, right? And I, what I mean by that is, you know, when you look at our protests, they might not look like y'all's protests, right? They might not sound like the same protests because 
folks were saying, this is what I wear every day, I'm not going to change that because the cameras are here, right? This is what I listen to every day. This is, Kendrick Lamar is my protest music, that's what I'm gonna play at the protest, right? Um, and suddenly you're seeing all of these various shades, literally and figuratively of blackness that weren't allowed before, right? We can be rageful, we can be frustrated, we can be angry justifiably, and we're not going to silence that simply because it makes you uncomfortable. We're going to create our own space and make sure that that's allowed. We can also introduce black joy and love into the space, right? You know, we, we talk a lot about the fact that we came out there because we love one another. We came out there because we love Michael Brown. We came out there because we love ourselves. And so while other people saw anger and rage and hate, we felt love and that's what kept us coming out there every single day. Um, and, and, and to be allowed to be both black and woman and uh, joyful and frustrated and a protester and rageful and a policy person and all of the things at once is something that often black folks have not been allowed to be. So owning the space and creating our own space allows us to be fully human in, in front of America. Mm -hmm. I'd also... Yeah, yeah, hey, you, if your conversation go on, step in. In, in our time, um, our issues were very straightforward. There was right and wrong, there was moral and immoral, there were just laws and unjust laws, the right to vote and the right the public to use public accommodations. Those were our issues. It was later, about 1968, with Dr. King, we, we in SNCC in 1966 um, were the first to oppose the war in Vietnam. And then um, Dr. King uh, gave his Riverside Church address when he came out against the war. A lot of his support, most of his support dried up. Then he went, began to connect the, the um, economic issues by organizing a poor people's campaign here on the grounds of the mall in DC. He was assassinated just before it um, started, but the but the encampment went on where poor people were camped out in tents on the mall. Um, what, as I said earlier, we had mimeograph machines. We had to call friends of SNCC groups, like we may call somebody at Oberlin College, head of friends of SNCC and tell them, get the word out to your local media that there have been some, there's been a shooting. One of our workers was shot. Jimmy Travis was shot in the neck. Or, that's, Mr. Lee has been murdered. Or, and that was how we got the message out. Local media definitely didn't cover us. I can remember being at that same campaign in Greenwood, um, where Marion was running down the street, and I, and there was Claude Sitton from the New York Times, uh, what's his name from the, from Newsweek, and then there was Larry Steele from Jet Magazine. Mm -hmm. I can remember when I first saw Dan Rather. Any of you remember Dan Rather? <laughs> <laughs> Dan Rather came down to cover. I'll tell you when the media came, and it was very calculated. There were only 31 of us in Mississippi. And as Bob Moses says now, Bob says, we were co conducting a guerrilla campaign mm. with 31 of us trying to stay alive. It got to the point where they were arresting us as soon as we stepped onto the street. They were arresting, I got arrested for going to a church, a white church, to try to worship with these white folks who didn't want me in, in there in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> and I spent a week in jail. <laughs> because of it. Um, and a, a good side story is that Ralph Bunch, the undersecretary of the UN, was coming to Tougaloo College. My mentor, Ernst Berinsky, a Holocaust survivor, had invited him to come to speak at the Social Science Forum. We were, didn't know we were gonna be in jail when he, he got there. So we all of us signed a, a note and gave it to uh, one of the faculty members to give, to ask, Ralph Bunch to come by the jail to see us. He came, but it was not on visiting day. It was not on Wednesday, so he couldn't get in to see us. 
They only allowed you in once a week, you know, for a couple of hours. But that was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I always, you know, remember that story. But uh, <coughs> the, as I said, the, the media came in 1964, and because we, we, just, we conceived of a Mississippi Freedom Summer, in order to bring the white kids in, because we knew that they were the sons and daughters of the powerful, not so powerful, but connected politically, economically, and that the media would follow them. And they did. They all, the networks were there, print media were there, they were covering the white kids. But we got a chance to continue organizing. So that summer we organized the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, we went to Atlantic City to the um, National Democratic Party Convention, where we tried to get the, the white, regular, segregated delegation unseated and have our Freedom Democratic Party seated in the stead, because we had, had three or four white people in our, in our delegation. Um, and that was when they offered us three seats. And Ms. Hamer said, Fannie Lou Hamer said, we didn't come here for no three seats because all of us is tired. Mm -hmm. So, question mm -hmm. uh, to DeRay and to Brittany. Because you spoke, I mean, there's so much in what Joyce has just said, but one of the things that's in Joyce's remarks are about allies. About? Allies. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you referenced uh, one of the professors who, by the way, was brought to black colleges by Ralph Bunch who placed uh, survivors of the Holocaust at uh, historically black colleges in the 40s and 50s because uh, majority institutions in the Northeast didn't want Jewish professors. Except, and they, except they, for Einstein. Uh, except for Einstein, he was the one. But, uh, uh, but some, of these, uh, some of these professors became, and, and you spoke of Professor Brosky, who became Bursky, who became an ally and a champion in Jackson, Mississippi. What about allies and champions outside of our community in the Black Lives Matter movement? Mm, I don't, uh, let me just start by saying to the last question, I think that people of color, we've always faced these issues of erasure, and erasure often manifests in two ways. One is that either the story is never told or it's told by everybody but us. Yeah. And we became the unerased in August 2014. Like we literally got to tell our own stories in ways that we couldn't that were really powerful. I think that, um, you know, I think of one example with Martise, Martise Johnson, who got beat up at UVA by the police. I remember that morning I got, uh, I kept getting all these tweets about some kid named Martise, and I didn't know what was happening. I had a big following. I didn't want to retweet it and get everybody worked up, and it wasn't, it was like a story or something. So I retweet, I, I DM a girl, I send her a private message, a direct message, and, I, um, <laughs> and I'm like, can you hop on the phone Definition, for a second? Right, and she right, gets on the right. phone and I say, like, is my, can you confirm that Martise is your friend? Like, is this a real person? Like, that I, and she's like, yes, my friend's in the hospital. And then we just go full fledged. So I call the president's office at UVA and I say, hi, my name's DeRay. Can I get a statement about the beating of Martise Johnson? And they're like, oh, we have no clue what you're talking about. And I'm like, can you direct me to communications then? So I go to communications. I'm like, can I, can I get a statement about the beating of Martise Johnson? And they're like, we will take your number down and we'll call you back. And then I call Netta, we tweet, call the president's office, and we get like thousands of people to call the president's <laughs> office and just ask for a statement about the media of Martise Johnson. And then people call USA Today is like, can we do an interview? I'm like, I've never been to UVA. I don't know Martise. <laughs> like, I don't, but y'all need to go, you know, BuzzFeed. Like, and that has been the power that we have we right. sort of stumbled upon is like we could make a crisis, we mm -hmm. could help amplify the crisis for people in ways that are really powerful. In terms of allies, I'll sort of throw this to, uh, hmm. I think Brittany has a, will have a better answer. In terms of, I think there are a lot of people who want to do really good work. I think that, like, how do we organize without organizations is something we've been really interested in. Like, how can we create infrastructure for people to do good work? I think that we found so often that people believe that infrastructure necessarily means organizations, and that is something that I don't think we believe. Um, so that's been interesting for us to play with. And then I think that the success of the movement will be about coalition building. Can we create entrances for people to the work who might not have shared goals but have shared outcomes? Mm -hmm. So the gun control people, you put our goals together. We don't have the same goals. We want to live in the same world, though. The environmentalists, we don't have the same goals, but we want to live in the same world. We want to live in a world where the water is not dirty like Flint. Like, that is real. And can we create entrances for people, um, again, who don't have the same goals but have the same outcomes, who want to live in the same world, I think will be a measure of our success. 
-hmm. Brittany. Um, and, and people who have questions, if you'll start queuing up at, a, at, a, at one of these microphones. So uh, I'll share two quick things. One I shared yesterday at um, a, a panel on allies and co-conspirators. Um, and and I, I really do prefer kind of the language of co-conspirators or um, accomplices because like I, I don't want people who are just gonna like be my ally on a Monday and then label themselves my ally on a Tuesday and you've not done anything for me. I really want folks who are gonna like be in the work and be ready to get their hands dirty, be ready to get arrested, be ready to stand with me in front of me, whatever, to do, to do that. Um, and, I, and I think of that um, in the context of what it means to uh, show charity versus solidarity. And so the example that I shared yesterday is that charity is that your organization can feed a community for 50 years. You get out there every single day, you provide hot meals to people who need them. Solidarity though, is saying let's gather the economic resources to not make this neighborhood a food desert and build several grocery stores. When we build those grocery stores, let's make sure to employ the people in this community, not just as baggers, right, but also at the, the top levels of the organization. Let's make sure that this grocery store teaches people about proper nutrition so that this is not a generational effect. And let's make sure that the grocery store works with neighborhood organizations such that this grocery store being here doesn't gentrify the neighborhood and kick the people out that the grocery store was supposed to help, right? And so, if you really want to be an ally, go do that, right? But I also want to speak in the context not of white versus people of color, which is often how we immediately think of allies. Everyone in this room is or should be, right, an ally to our children, to our students, and to the communities that they live in, to the families that they belong to, who do us um, who, who show us an, an immense amount of privilege that they give us their children every day, right? Like, let's not take that for granted. Um, and I'm gonna keep it really real. When, those, uh, when a lot of those folks, those parents, those students, those pastors that have been in our communities for a long time, those imams, like those leaders, when they look at us, they don't necessarily see themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's not just because a lot of ed reform organizations aren't, um, aren't structurally diverse enough, right? It is because when they see us coming so often, they see the loss of their democracy. And so often they're not wrong because we'll sit in a room around a conference table and make decisions for other people without ever consulting, the, consulting them, talking to them, listening to them, asking them what they want. And so if we are to be allies to our children in, those commu in our communities, we have to make room for self-determination. And that's really what I think this movement has been about. It's been about black people saying, we're not gonna ask for it anymore, we're gonna take it. And when we do that, we're going to determine the future that we want for ourselves. Our communities are more than capable of telling us what they want for themselves. Our communities do have a vision. And, and somebody asked me earlier, well, how do we start that conversation? The conversation's already happening. If you go into the places where our people are, they're talking about the world they want to live in versus what the world is now, right? Folks in Flint are damn sure talking about the fact that they don't want to drink dirty water anymore. Our parents are definitely talking about the fact that they don't want to send their child to an unaccredited school. They know what kind of school they want to send their child to. Are we seeking invitation into those spaces? Are we building relationships such that we would be invited into those spaces in the first place? And when we get there, are we putting our PowerPoint and our agenda away and actually listening intently and saying, you set the vision and then you tell me how to go work, right? And so that is how we can be allies in a real way um, and dismiss the paternalism that unfortunately has so often become our hallmark. All right. Oh, I don't. I don't have anything. I'm just waiting for the. Okay. All right. You're leaning in. Okay. Just one final point. Um, a lot of what the two of you have talked about is, is what I would call the ex excavation of the authentic self and presenting that your authentic self to the people with whom you work. Ella Baker, Miss Baker, as all of us still call her. We never called her Ella. We never called Fannie Lou Hamer Fanny. They were myths. <laughs> Um, but Ella Baker used to tell us that strong people don't need leaders. And we had a mantra, a mantra, where we said, let the people decide. And so as you talked about listening to the people, they know what their problems are, as you just said. 
And you start with another thing we said, we start with where the people are. Mm. Um, we wore that picture. There was a picture of all of us up there, but I'm standing there at a podium at Tougaloo College in a denim overall skirt. We wore those uh, in order to identify with, with the people we were working with. Of course, middle class people say, what is your woolly hair doing? I mean, why don't you straighten your hair? Or why are you wearing overalls? Didn't I send you to college to better yourself? Uh, but you wear, you try to present all of this as part of presenting the true self to the people you're working with. And they, we often wondered how did the local people in Mississippi follow us, 18, 19 year old kids. And it was because we presented our true selves to them and we listened to them and we treated them with dignity. And that's what you have to do. Mm. That's right. That's right. All right. I'm we were ready. honest and they saw the honesty. I, we have questions. Just say who you are, where you're from, and ask your question with a question mark. Okay, my name is Camille Bridges. I am from Detroit, Michigan, and I am a 2016 core member. I'll be placed in Eastern North Carolina. And first, I do just want to say thank you to all of you for being here. I'm deeply humbled and honored that I'm being able to um, talk with you today. So my question is for each of you. Because it seems that each and every day something bad is happening. I come home from school in January and I see the news about all these teachers protesting about the state of Detroit Public Schools, which is disheartening for me because I have family that goes to those schools and it, it hurts so badly. So my question for all of you is where do you find the will and the patience to keep doing your work? Because it hurts and it hurts because I'm about to be a teacher and I have to see these things every day. And it, I want to keep working for it and I want to work hard for it. So how do you find the will to do that? Anybody? Well, I guess the first thing to say is uh, pain is part of life. You grow as a consequence of coping with that pain. There's no utopia, unfortunately. But you find the will in understanding who you are and what your purpose is. There's a reason why you're on the planet. It's your job to figure that out. And then take on all comers and deal with it. And also there, there should be strength. That we found strength in numbers. We always relied very heavily on each other. And you're much better when you can find that cohort of other teachers and other people in the community that you, who share your vision and your interest. And, uh, and you derive strength. But pain is part of the process. It hurts. Go ahead. And I think about my students as people that motivate me every day. Like I taught uh, sixth grade math in East New York, Brooklyn, which was great. And uh, I knew them when they were 11 years old and they're like, you know, 17, 18 now. I'm like, who are you? I, I don't know this person. <laughs> but, you know, I think about so much of it is like fighting because I know they deserve a better world and, they, and, and I'm, I'm complicit in that. And I think I got a call recently from Mitchell, one of my, one of my students, uh, and he's riled, I haven't talked to this kid since he was 11. And he was always really good at math, and he's always great, and his family's great. But he calls me, and he's like, Mr. McKesson, and he is worked up. And I'm, he's like, I had this thing happen to me in class, and the president of the school came over, and he said something that wasn't okay, and I had to tell him that wasn't okay. And I'm like, yes, Mitchell. And his mother's <laughs> in the background, and he's like, I'm calling you because my mother disagreed with me saying something to him. And his mother's in the background like, Mr. McKesson, that's not what I told him. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I haven't talked to y'all in, you know, since 2009. But it was this moment where he was like so pumped. And I'm like, Mitchell, I think you did the right thing. Let me talk to your mother. Uh, but, you know, it was like this thing that was like, yes, right? Like, I am out here fighting every day for, for you, right? Like, I think about you all the time. And you called me. And, you know, he like had this thing about, he was like, Mr. McKesson, I had to tell him that wasn't okay for him to say. And I'm like, you tell him. You know, it was, it was this moment that just like made it all real for me. Or like I was at Howard. We moved in. Brittany and I have a mutual friend in protest. We moved him into college. And this girl runs up to me and she's like, Mr. McKesson. And I'm like, oh, it's so good to meet you. And she's like, I'm Shantoy. And I'm like, oh my, Shantoy, you are a Howard. You know what I mean? Like, I remember teaching you fractions. You know, so, <laughs> so that is, oh my God. I was like, whoa. So, 
uh, those things like are really real for me that like you know we've had some awful experiences and mm. I've slept in more cars than I thought I ever would <laughs> sleep in ever you know like knocked out in the car um, or I, I you know I, I worry about too with the trauma like I the adrenaline is gone some days like I don't even you know I got into an awful accident I got out of the car called the police and was like you know I just need to go to sleep like I I couldn't even be worked up I couldn't cry like it was just like the, the adrenaline was gone but I fight because like they just deserve a better world, and, and I'm a part of that. Yeah. Mm. Really? Your teachers will, your students will remember you if you are memorable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Brittany, it's a true story. <laughs> That's a true story. You know, I um, I, I would absolutely agree about about students being my motivator every day. Um, the person that we moved into to Howard is a young man named Clifton Kinney, who was one of our students in St. Louis, um, who is like one of the most powerful people I've ever met in my entire life. And like I am because he is, right? And so um, getting to know him over the last year and a half and understanding what people put in him is part of the reason why I didn't leave my job, right? Like, it was really tempting to just go be in the movement full time, but I have this incredible privilege to go and develop hundreds of teachers every year that can hopefully develop thousands of Cliftons, right? Who is so brave, and for every Clifton, there are hundreds, thousands of other kids going out and being him every day. Um, and that is, that is so much motivation, right? It's motivation because it's like I went I want him to go be president of the United States, and I, I, want, I, I want that to not be an anomaly, right? I want, <laughs> I want that to be a part of the fabric of who we are. Right. Um, and I, and, and I will also say, right, that like, self, if, when, sweetheart, self-care is a real thing. Do not let anybody tell you that you need to work yourself to the bone. We've been telling black women that for too long. Mm. Okay, so do take care of yourself. Like, I love DeRay. I love the fact that DeRay can treat all day. I'll, I'll turn it off for three days and be like, I'll, I'll catch y'all on Tuesday. It's fine. Um, but the, because that's my self-care, right? It doesn't look the same for everybody. Um, and then the last thing I'll say really is that concept of love that I talked about in the beginning. Like, I am, my parents were amazing. And they did so many things for me, right? And they helped me to have an appreciation for everyone but most of all, they helped me understand who I am and where I come from, such that I love being black. Like, I love it. I love our hair, I love our beats. Like, I love, I love the way we talk. I love the fact that we like set the standard for what's dope, like, I love it, <laughs> right? I love the way we worship, I love the way we greet people, the way we welcome people, and like, I love us so much that I will fight for us, right? If you love something, you fight for it. Every single day when it gets hard, every single day when I got donor X in my ear, not cutting me a check anymore because I've told a little bit too much truth. Like, I, but I love us that much and there's nothing you can do for me that like I don't already have in myself because of what's been given to me, right? So we have everything in us we need to win. You have everything in you that you need to win. Are you going to ask a question over there? No, I'm going back. I'm, I think you're going to be the only one over there. Yes, go. Are you a questioner? <laughs> Take a um, Yep, I'm Andrew Darmola. I'm an 09 Milwaukee alum, and I currently work on staff in TFA Greater Philadelphia. Um, and so my question is, um, as somebody who's avidly followed the recent events, I sometimes wonder if the lack of a formal infrastructure, and I understand why that's so in this era and with these issues, hinders people from actively participating in our current movements. And how can we make sure that we achieve real outcomes and sustain progress? Like there's a lot of fire around events that happen from time to time, but how can we make sure that like, the work keeps pushing forward if there's no formal leadership or formal groups as such. All right, DeRay, is that you? Yeah, I think that I'm sensitive to the fact that it took us eight months to convince people that the police were a problem across the country. That like, you know, people will call and be like, DeRay, the police just killed somebody. And I'm like, we know, right? We, we've, been telling, we've been telling you, right? But it took like the death of Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, Sandra Bland for people to say like, okay, there's a crisis across the country. 
So I think about the awareness and recognition phase is like the first phase of the movement. Then I think we got into this legitimacy phase of like, are there demands, right? Like, what do people want? I think we got there. And then I think the next phase is uh, two prong. One will be about coalition building that I already talked about. And then it'll be about this, the inside outside game, right? The challenge from the outside change from the inside. I think that like, we'll start seeing that pop up and like, that will be a strategy. Can we be as organized on the inside as we have been on the outside? I believe we can. We sh the people we fight are surely organized on the inside. Um, so can we do that? Can we do that as well? I think is real. I think that our learning from the past is like, let's not have one leader so that you kill the movement. You, you kill the person, kill the movement. We, that is like, we've, we're working really hard for that not to be the way we do it. And then there are a lot of really great organizations that are doing work. And then a lot of people who are not in organizations that are also doing work. And like, we believe that all of that is really important. I'm mindful that it was no organization that got anybody out in the street in St. Louis. That like people came out and it wasn't an organization that kept people out. It was people. I worry that the myth of the movement that has emerged is this idea that like somebody sat in a room and like made the movement. Like that's not true. It was like those people in St. Louis on August 9th who came out and refused to go home and the people who made those commitments every day. Like that is the true origin story. And like that's so powerful because it reminds you that like you're enough to start a movement. Like that's the message. Uh, and that's so powerful. So I think that it is not hampering. I, I don't think the movement suffers from there being no leader mm. or anything like that. I, I, I'm mindful that the movement is young. Last that this is like a young space. Last question. Quick uh, my name is Darren Camilleri, a member of the Detroit Corps. Um, so thank you again for bringing up the stories of the people of Flint, um, as well as to the first questioner about the Detroit Public Schools. And you know, for months we've been thinking a lot about these stories that are now finally making national attention, where people in, in Flint have been poisoned for over two years. We have Detroit Public Schools that have been crumbling for decades, and nothing is, is getting done until potentially now. Uh, and I heard all of you talk about the difficulties in terms of people's stories and their truths not being heard and believed. Mm -hmm. So what does it take in order for those stories to be heard and believed? I can, um, so when the DOJ report came out in Ferguson, I'm really glad you asked that question, by the way, thank you. When the DOJ report came out in Ferguson, there were kind of two halves of the report. There was one half that talked about the killing of Michael Brown, and there was another half that talked about life for people of color in Ferguson. That second half was really kind of what set the media ablaze in particular, because it, it did something that we see very rarely in bureaucracies, and it allowed lived experience to actually count as evidence, right? So often we ascribe to this dominant cultural value that unless there's a number attached to it, it doesn't matter when we're living every single day in this skin, right? And like what our lives are falsehood, right? Is, is, what happen, is what is happening to us not real? And so there was just story after story after story of the abuse and trauma people were facing every single day. Driving, trying to get to work. Driving, trying to go and get their child, right? Getting a speeding ticket and then being caught in an endless debt cycle because, and, and having their children taken, like all of these crazy things because you ran a stop sign, right? And so, what I truly believe we have to do, especially those of us who work within systems and institutions, is ensure that bureaucracies actually prioritize the lived experience of their constituents. So I sit on the Ferguson Commission, and when you go to our website, you have to actually like search to find our report, because most of our website is people's stories. Most of our website is people saying, this is what's happened to me. And if this thing that I helped inspire becomes true as a result of these recommendations, here's how it will affect my life. And so, you know, the, it, with social media, with, with whatever, we have to keep those stories out there. But especially when we have the power to, to, to move and evolve institutions, we have to make sure that we put people at the center instead of numbers. Can I say something very briefly? One of the differences between your generation and ours, and I say this because we in, at the SNCC Legacy Project you know, I've had an intergenerational conference at Duke University a couple of months ago. Um, some of the people in the Black Lives Matter movement have come to us to, to ask, what advice would you give us? And we say three things, organize, organize, organize. You disseminate the, the information about what's happening at the grassroots level. You build the coalitions of people at the grassroots level. You vote people out of office at the grassroots level. You run your own candidates at the grassroots level. I hope that's what you're gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I promise you, the 
I'll bring some SNCC workers over to go door to door. <laughs> because we look at how you mobilize on Twitter and Facebook. And we wonder when are you going to do the, go to the next step of organizing, getting the constituency built from the ground up. That's the difference that we see between the generations. I know you're going to get to it, but hurry. Otherwise, you <laughs> No, you really got to hurry and do it. You got to do it. It's one thing to have a lot of people marching, as Dr. King understood, but another to be able to get those constituents to go to the polls and to do other things. Thank you, Joe. I know we're almost over. In fact, we've probably gone over. But I just think that having run for political office myself and served in political office and run twice for mayor and lost, uh, I, I have great sympathy and empathy for anybody who's running for mayor. And I just think that we ought to at least hear a word from DeRay yeah. on what's happening. <laughs> Are you going to tell us anything, DeRay? <laughs> Now, DeRay, you'd be the only politician who's never told a <laughs> microphone in front of him and didn't say something. <laughs> You know, I can, uh, you know, people are saying a whole lot of stuff about me, so, uh, you know. <laughs> are you running against is, the prosecutor's husband? Yeah, so there, you know, what I'll say is that I am, um, you know, today is day three, and there is, uh, we have a long way to go, and I'm, like, really appreciative of everybody's uh, support, um, and, you know, there, I, there's some stuff I can't say, but I'm like really excited about what we're about to do next and, and those sort of things. So I appreciate everybody. Um, and hopefully we can talk about it, not in a panel format, but so <laughs> offline. He trying to get me in trouble. He trying to get me in trouble over here. What, what, what? Do you he want to, to win or do, are you using this as a way to mobilize? <laughs> they are trying to get me no, in trouble. No, seriously. Oh, Here's no. the staff. They're right. trying to get him in trouble is what we're trying to do. Absolutely. You know, you know there are rules. There are rules. You know, there are enough people that hate me that I'm sure somebody from the other campaigns is like here being like, DeRay's it. Um, you know, it <laughs> he is, doesn't want to win. <laughs> it is. So we, you know, we're, uh, I believe in big bets and we're making a lot of big bets. And I think that the, everything we've done in the movement has been a series of big bets, and I think that we've seen them pay off. So I wouldn't do anything that I didn't think that we couldn't do. Uh, and I know the big bets that we've made, and I, and I believe that we can get to, um, get to like the desired outcome that is not just changing the conversation, but changing people's lives. Like I believe that. Um, and the thing about big bets is real, that we've made a series of them. And to, again, today is day three, and we've seen some of those bets, uh, those bets manifest. So. So that is my uh, safe answer for the panel. Okay. <laughs> well, um, what a wonderful privilege I think it's been for all of us to, uh, to be here in this space uh, today to experience Brittany and Terrence and Joyce and DeRay. Um, we have an image of Coretta Scott King um, I first met Joyce Ladner in 1969 when I joined the faculty of Morehouse College right. as an instructor of English earning $6,200 a year and uh, <laughs> lived on Chestnut Street. And at the corner of Beckwith and Chestnut was the Institute of the Black World, headed by Vincent Harding, a professor of history at Spelman, who had uh, brought together an extraordinary group of scholars in residence in that house which was reputed to have been at one point a home of W.E.B. Du Bois. And uh, over the course of the next years, um, C.L.R. James, uh, Horace Caton, uh, I mean, uh, Margaret, Walker. Margaret Walker, Shirley Graham Du Bois, I think of all of the incredible um, Walter, Rodney. Walter Rodney elders and youngers of uh, the academy and social justice and black thought uh, were at one point or another walking through there. And Joyce Ladner was at the beginning of her mm. academic career. In my second year. Yeah, writing, I think, Tomorrow's Tomorrow. Yeah, that's where I, I did. I, it's the most productive year of my academic yeah. and, and so J Joyce was writing, but the, the Institute was also advancing the notion of 
uh, black studies, uh, culturally, culturally relevant pedagogy, I might suggest, uh, and the black university, and but also was helping Coretta Scott King uh, because it was closely associated with the beginning of the uh, King Center for Nonviolent Social Change to assemble all of Dr. King's letters and papers and those of uh, other scholars and activists of the period. And I think, you know, for those of us who had the privilege choice of being there at that time, we, we almost took for granted that we were there with the people of the movement uh, in Atlanta. And Mrs. King, who uh, was an incredible individual in so many ways, but we're gonna close with Mrs. King's words, that freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. We've heard from um, those who have earned it and won it and battled for us for now six decades and continue to do that today. What a privilege. Thank you very much.